Good morning. Good morning, and uh, first let me apologize. I didn't know you were all waiting for me. Um, I didn't understand that I was supposed to just come up here and open. But now that I do, here we go. Um, so welcome, all of you. It's, it's an absolute privilege to have you here at today's Law Review Symposium, the law and policy of hydraulic fracturing, addressing the issues of the natural gas boom. Who would have thought that such a dry title leads to such incredibly important and controversial issues? Um, so it's a real, it, and for me, it's also a privilege to be able to open this conference, and I thank you, Ben, and Paul, and the Law Review staff for inviting me to do this. Um, it's wonderful and exciting to have this kind of event here. Um, our Law Review staff has, as it always does, assembled a group of first-rate scholars who are sure to provoke stimulating discussion throughout the day. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Paul Janowitz, who put this program together, Ben Ristow, one of the most forward-thinking editors-in-chief that I can imagine, and Bobby Charon, our publisher whose entrepreneurial energy has led our law review to innovation unique in American legal scholarship. And of course, the law review staff, of whom we're all very proud. I'd also like to thank Nancy Pratt, who always does a spectacular job of ensuring that our lectures, conferences, and symposia are first-rate productions, and Associate Dean Jonathan Enton, whose years of counsel to our law review have made it the vibrant publication that it is today. Symposia and conferences like this represent two very important and related dimensions of what we do here, our emphasis on scholarship and the publication of our law review. The study, analysis, investigation, and creation of solutions to legal issues are at the heart of the academic enterprise. As teachers, our scholarship allows us to continue to develop and expand our ideas, leads us to question our own understandings, and allows us from year to year to bring our freshest ideas to our students. As scholars, our work advances knowledge and understanding in a field that undergirds the structure of our society and ensures its functioning. Legal scholarship is a special kind of scholarship. I've always considered law to be the applied fulcrum of the social sciences with a heavy dose of the humanities thrown in. While we have theory that is peculiar to law, much of the theoretical underpinnings of our discipline, whether visibly or not, draws from many other fields. Thus, our scholarship, while sometimes quite theoretical, ultimately has a purpose grounded in the world around us because law only matters in its application. By engaging in legal, legal scholarship, we help to advance our society. The importance of legal scholarship to our law school and to the world around us is what brings us here today. More immediately, what brings us here today is our law review staff. Our law review symbolizes legal scholarship within our law school community. But of course, it's more than that. The staff of the Law Review not only ensures that high quality legal scholarship is published, but they themselves advance that scholarship. For example, this year, our Law Review became the first in the country to tie its publication of top articles to podcasts featuring the author and two commentators. This innovation literally brings scholarship to life and it provides readers with a broader context and set of ideas with which to engage the work than they otherwise might have. I'm hugely proud of our Law Review staff and look forward to many more such innovative developments. Our topic today is of great national importance and one that is also especially important to our region. I noticed my house starting to sink a little bit this morning. Um, hydraulic fracturing holds great promise for our energy needs. At the same time, it raises difficult and often novel legal issues across the board. From ownership concerns to environmental law issues to who's supposed to regulate, Hydraulic fracturing has captured our nation's attention. The scholarship presented today is scholarship that matters. In this way, today's symposium follows our law review's tradition of publishing scholarship that makes a difference. As recent symposia have addressed issues of health care, access to courts, corporations and their communities, prosecutorial ethics, and other current and important topics. So thank you. By being here today, you demonstrate your engagement on an intellectual as well as a practical level with the issues before us. By being here today, you help to enlighten the discussion. By being here today, you grace our law school with a kind of intellectual richness for which we are known. Thank you and enjoy the program. Good morning. Um, I'm Jonathan Enton. I am. I have a lot of hats around here, but uh, for today, the one that matters is that I'm the advisor of the Law Review, 
uh, and it is uh, a real pleasure for me to see how uh, much work and how creative uh, and dedicated our staff has been. Um, uh, you might note that they actually have their first issue on the street. Uh, it's been out for a few days and, and, uh, uh, I, and I know that uh, they've got copies uh, around uh, and you might want to take a look at those. My immediate task here is uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, to open our symposium, we are honored to have Thomas W. Merrill as our keynoter. Tom Merrill is the Charles Evans Hughes Professor at Columbia Law School. Before moving to Columbia, he was the John Paul Stevens Professor at Northwestern University School of Law. You might see a pattern here. Um, in fact, uh, Professor Merrill has had a long connection to the Supreme Court, starting with his clerkship for Justice Blackmun, uh, and including service uh, as Deputy Solicitor General of the United States. Um, he's published significant articles about the court, including a remarkable study of the influence of amicus curiae briefs uh, in the court over the 50-year period uh, immediately following World War II. Beyond that, Professor Merrill has done pathbreaking scholarship in the fields of property, environmental law, and administrative law. Uh, the book, the, the program book would be substantially longer if we had included uh, Professor Merrill's entire uh, bibliography. His scholarship has brought sophisticated new insights to some venerable legal doctrines and has raised important questions about emerging topics using the tools of economics, history, statistics, and traditional sorts of doctrinal analysis. Professor Merrill also is no stranger to these halls. Uh, he has been here before uh, to be part of programs about Kilo against the city of New London, uh, the big eminent domain case of a few years ago, and more recently a program on the Dodd-Frank Act. We're delighted to have Tom back. Please welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Tom Merrill. Can I flip this down, or is that going to cause a technological accident? Anyway. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dean Mitchell, and thank you, Jonathan, for that very generous introduction, which should tip everyone off that I really don't know anything about fracking. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll uh, try to give a speech on it anyway. Uh, it's, uh, it's like many other issues in American society, uh, rapidly uh, produced very polarized positions. On the one hand, uh, you have the people who use the word game changer uh, to suggest that fracking is the solution to practically all of our national ills. It's going to end unemployment. Uh, it's going to uh, cure the balance of payments. It's going to uh, produce uh, energy independence, uh, and so on and so forth. The Wall Street Journal earlier this week had an editorial called Saudi America, uh, which sounds uh, many of these uh, exuberant themes. On the other hand, you have uh, the Cassandras uh, in the environmental movement uh, who say that uh, uh, Horizontal hydraulic fracturing is a catastrophe in waiting. Uh, it's going to uh, perhaps result in the despoliation of uh, massive amounts of groundwater. And by the way, it's going to rehabilitate the carbon molecule, uh, which is uh, the enemy of everyone who's trying to do something about climate change. So I really applaud the Law Review for putting together this conference uh, at this point in time. Law professors in particular, I can't speak for the others, but law professors have a real tendency to want to dwell on, uh, be backward looking, I look in the rearview mirror and we start talking about last term Supreme Court case or some legislation that was enacted in the past. Uh, this conference is devoted to uh, forward looking uh, concerns about an emerging problem uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the discussion today uh, featuring many experts uh, as well as amateurs uh, uh, will try to focus on constructive solutions to uh, some of the issues that uh, this new development presents. Since I'm the leadoff uh, hitter here, I thought it might make sense for me to say something very briefly about what exactly is uh, horizontal hydro hydraulic fracturing. Uh, 
I'm not a petroleum engineer. Uh, this is kind of my lay person's understanding, but, uh, and the panelists uh, know this better than I do, but there may be some in the audience who are relatively new to the topic, and it might be useful to have some context. Um, traditional oil and gas uh, uh, production involves drilling a, a vertical well pipe from the surface to some type of oil or gas reservoir in the ground. Uh, because of the weight of the rock above the reservoir, uh, the oil and gas is under great pressure. And so once the pipe penetrates the reservoir, the pressure causes the oil and gas to rise through the pipe to the surface where it can be gathered for commercial re uh, use. Reservoir is a bit of a misnomer here. Sometimes there's literally a pool of oil and gas trapped in sedimentary layers of rock, but often the oil and gas is contained in permeable rock. Uh, but in order to extract it, the rock must be sufficiently permeable that oil and gas will flow through it uh, up into the pipe and to the surface once the p deposit is penetrated by the well pipe. Petroleum engineers have long understood that there's a great deal of oil and gas in the ground that's trapped in rocks that is not permeable in the sense that it will not flow uh, and hence uh, can't be extracted by simple drilling of a vertical pipe uh, relying upon uh, natural pressure. In other words, the fissures and pores uh, in the rock are too tight, as the word goes, to allow the oil and gas to flow. These engineers have long sought a way to open up these fissures to let the trapped gas flow out. One technology for doing this, which has actually been around for about 60 years and is now routinely used to enhance the production from conventional oil and gas wells, is called hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing involves pumping a fluid down into the well uh, after it's been completed, um, which uh, is under great pressure. The fluid, which is mostly water with some uh, uh, abrasive like sand or ceramic balls, uh, plus a little bit of uh, chemical lubricating uh, substances, uh, is under great pressure. It fractures the rock, ideally, and then the propens, the sand or the ceramic balls, hold the fractures open, and then when the fracking fluid is pulled back up or pumped back up to the surface, Ideally, the oil and gas flows out uh, after it. This has been around for some time. The recent innovation, which has given rise to all of the stir about uh, uh, dramatic uh, uh, new uh, developments, uh, combines uh, hydraulic fracturing with another relatively new technology, which is horizontal drilling. Uh, this consists, as the name would imply, drilling down vertically and then at some point turning the bit uh, sideways and moving horizontally through a seam of rock. Much of the oil and gas that's in the ground is trapped in non-permeable rock seams, like thin, sh thin seams of shale rock, which could be only a few uh, hundred feet thick. A couple of dozen years ago, uh, a number of independent oil and gas producers started fiddling around with the idea that you could combine horizontal drilling with hydraulic fracturing, and this might be a way to extract gas from these thin seams of shale. Uh, they would drill down to the seam, turn the bit sideways, uh, turn the pipe uh, in horizontally, that is, into the, into the seam, and then inject the seam with fracturing fluid uh, to see if they could extract the oil and gas uh, that way. After a long period of trial and error, an independent gas producer named George Mitchell, uh, working in the uh, Barnett Shale near Fort Worth, Texas, uh, came across the right combination of horizontal drilling, pressure, propens, uh, and uh, uh, fluid removal techniques and got the gas uh, flowing out of the shale. Uh, his competitors quickly uh, observed uh, his success and started emulating it with some variations, but it took about 10 years for the rest of the world to wake up to what was going on uh, in the gas industry. Uh, what are the implications of Mr. Mitchell's little uh, sort of tinkering innovation? It now appears that it means nothing less than an enormous expansion in the reserves of oil and gas in the United States. No one knows exactly how much. Uh, to a large extent, it depends on the commercial price of oil and gas. It could mean a doubling of reserves. It could mean uh, even more. The impact of this sudden surge in reserves is somewhat different in the gas market and the oil market. Gas is transported primarily by pipeline which means that the relevant market is regional or national at best. Gas, if you will, is in a closed market. An expansion of gas reserves means a reduction in the price of gas. Oil is bought and sold on the world market, and so the impact there is different. Uh, and oil is being extracted using fracking technology now as well as gas. 
The surge in oil reserves in the United States will see some stabilization in price, but not very much because the price is essentially set on the world market. An expansion of oil reserves means more wealth for the United States and less for countries from which we currently uh, import oil. For both commodities, uh, the sudden expansion of reserves means more jobs in the oil and gas extraction industries. How much uh, is guesswork? President Obama, in his last State of the Union address, mentioned 600,000 additional jobs. That's a big deal in a soft economy. The unemployment rate in North Dakota, as I'm sure many of you have read, is currently 3.7 percent, uh, less than half the national average. North Dakota in the Back and Shell area is a big producer of oil and gas using fracking. Uh, workers on oil rigs or gas rigs in North Dakota currently make about $70,000 in five months. Supervisors earn $320,000 a year. And if you're lucky enough to own two square miles of land uh, above the back and shell, you get a $1 million royalty bonus up front and $500,000 a year for about the next 20 years. For gas, uh, there are other dramatic effects because of the closed market uh, that means a fall in gas prices. Uh, this has lots of obvious benefits. Home heating bills go down. Electric bills are stable or perhaps trending downward. Chemical and fertilizer plants that consume lots of gas or gas byproducts may begin to move back to the United States. Some heavy industry that was thinking of moving may stay or maybe come back because of lower energy costs. Other impacts of falling gas prices are more ambiguous in their import. The fracking revolution probably means, in my opinion, the end of the nuclear power industry in the United States. Nuclear power simply cannot compete with cheap gas as a source of combustion for power generation. The fracking revolution has thrown the coal industry into a tailspin. Coal producers like to blame the Obama EPA for launching a war on coal, uh, but a bigger problem is that coal is less attractive as a source of power generation for both economic and environmental reasons, certainly relative to cheap gas. Perhaps more problematically, lots of cheap gas also means that the solar power industry and the wind power industry will need even bigger government subsidies if they're going to stay afloat. If budgetary stringencies, and I've heard we have some, mean that those bigger subsidies are not going to be forthcoming, they too could be done in by cheap gas. On the oil front, the surge in domestic reserves will have less of an impact because the price uh, is largely fixed due to rising demand in Asia and the developing world offsetting increased production in the United States. But there still will be uh, big effects. The U.S. imports of oil are way down uh, from 60 percent of total oil consumption to about 40 percent and going further uh, downward. Uh, the recession uh, and improvements in uh, energy efficiency are partly responsible for this, but the big surge in domestic oil production, especially from North Dakota, is perhaps the biggest factor. North Dakota almost overnight now produces more oil than uh, every state but uh, Texas, having surpassed Alaska um, among the United States, and that's due entirely to fracking technology. The impact on the balance of payments is enormous. It could be as much as $100 billion a year uh, in the near future. Uh, that's money going to uh, lucky oil workers and landowners in North Dakota rather than to Saudi princes. Uh, the International Ener Energy Agency in Paris just announced earlier this week that it now estimates the United States will be the largest producer of oil in the world by 2020, surpassing Saudi Arabia. Energy independence, which every president since Nixon has claimed to be a top priority of the United States, uh, but was largely regarded as a fantasy by most experts, uh, is now, uh, that goal is now beginning to look like uh, less of a pipe dream with some projections saying we could achieve it by 2035. So that's a capsule summary of fracking and why it's a big deal. To say this came as a surprise to everyone, uh, energy experts, politicians, and economists would be an understatement. No one saw this coming as recently as 2008. Uh, the um, uh, Energy uh, Information Agency in the Department of Energy was projecting uh, that we would have to uh, continue to uh, uh, import, uh, or have to start importing uh, natural gas in the near future. So as uh, an unforeseen and startling development, uh, the fracking revolution presents a whole bunch of interesting questions. I would like to address four. These are not the only interesting questions, but they're ones that particularly resonate with me, uh, uh, a property and sometimes environmental law instructor. Here, in brief, are the four questions. First, 
Why did fracking technology, perhaps the most important innovation in energy technology in a generation, emerge in the United States rather than somewhere else? Answering this question may provide some clues about the conditions that promote innovation in developing new sources of energy more, de more generally. Second, are there any novel environmental risks presented by fracking? Fracking undoubtedly possesses, uh, presents uh, uh, environmental risks, but we need to ascertain whether they are the kinds of risks that can be, ad can be addressed by ratcheting up existing regulatory systems or whether something entirely new is needed. Third, if there are novel risks associated with fracking, what's the best regulatory strategy for addressing those risks? And fourth and finally, what should a concerned citizen anxious about the prospect of global warming think about fracking? Is fracking something to be opposed uh, in order to promote the transition to alternative energy, or is it something to be embraced as a bridge to a greener future? These are big questions. My answers are inevitably tentative and based on limited information, uh, both my own and those of uh, the fact that we have limited information about these questions more generally. Okay, why did fracking start in the United States? One possible explanation can be ruled out. Uh, it was not developed by research funded by the federal government. Uh, over the years, the Department of Energy has channeled billions of dollars in grants to new sources of energy ranging from nuclear fusion to synthetic fuels to photovoltaic sails to battery technology to hydrogen cars. But very little money has ever been uh, channeled toward research devoting new oil and gas extraction techniques. Recent presidents have proposed zero dollars for such research. Congress, starting about 2008, insisted on uh, appropriating about $50 million a year. Uh, to this end, uh, well after frac fracking technology had already been uh, developed. <coughs> now, this doesn't mean the federal role is entirely irrelevant. Although no grant money went to fracking, the federal government provided a subsidy in the form of a special tax break. Buried in the 1980 tax bill designed primarily to impose a windfall profits tax on oil and gas producers was a obscure provision known as Section 29 that provided special federal tax credits for drilling for so-called unconventional natural gas. Um, this special credit um, uh, no doubt helped keep several of the small producers going uh, as they tried to perfect fracking in the Bar Barnett Shale uh, area of Texas uh, throughout the 1990s. So government support was a factor, uh, but the type of government support didn't take the form of the government picking and choosing particular grant recipients. Rather, the support took the form of a general tax credit that was broadly available to anyone who could claim to be drilling for unconventional gas. In effect, the decision to take the subsidy was made unilaterally by individual producers, each of whom could choose based upon its own calculus of benefits and costs whether to take the subsidy or leave it on the table. Okay, what about industry structure? Another possibility that we can eliminate is the fact that the innovation came from the research department of one of the major oil companies that continually advertise on television uh, their commitment to innovation in energy. It's true that many of the majors are American corporations and that these companies invest huge sums of money searching for new sources of energy and new ways of extracting it, but the critical breakthrough came not from a major but from a relatively small independent company uh, in Texas uh, that uh, it had nothing comparable to the resources available to one of the major oil companies. So if we eliminate uh, government research grants and research by major oil companies, what do I think are in fact the conditions that led to the United States being way ahead of everybody else in terms of developing this new technology? Uh, I would uh, mention several possible factors. One, uh, and this comes from my uh, orientation as being a property professor, is that mineral rights in the United States are primarily privately owned. The United States follow, follows something called the ad kellum rule, in which the owner of land is deemed to own the air rights above the land and the subsurface rights below the land. Ownership of subsurface rights includes the right to extract minerals found by drilling down into the subsurface column below the land, including oil and gas. That's why in the Beverly Hillbillies show, the discovery of oil under the Clampett Farm led to the family moving to Beverly Hills. The United States is something of an outlier in this regard. Most other countries follow the rule that subsurface minerals belong to the government, and so permission from the government is required to engage in subsurface mineral development. Why might ownership of subsurface mineral rights translate into greater innovation in drilling technology? <coughs> 
you might be thinking, oh, well, greed, greedy landowners. Uh, but I'm not sure that the governments that control the mineral rights uh, in the other parts of the world are necessarily more public spirited than the landowners who agree to enter into leases of their mineral rights to oil and gas production companies. I would emphasize something else, decentralization of control. In a country like the United States that follows the Ed Kellum rule, ownership and hence control over subsurface minerals is fragmented among tens of thousands of separate owners. A production company that wants to experiment with an innovative technology can always find an owner willing to take the risk, or if you're cynical, a sucker who's ignorant of the risks to convey the required rights. When mineral rights are owned by the government, access is controlled by a centralized bureaucracy. Bureaucracies tend to be slow and cautious. Promoting innovation in extraction technologies that could easily end up a bust is hard to explain to your boss. So that's one possibility. Another factor, I think, is that fracking, uh, is that the regulation of oil and gas production in the United States is almost entirely a matter of state rather than federal law. The explanation for this, I think, is historical. Oil and gas production developed well before the 1970s when the federal government uh, environmental law came on the scenes. Oil and gas regulation was traditionally a state matter and was primarily oriented toward promoting production rather than controlling environmental harms. Probably because regulatory structures were already in place at the state level when the federal government started uh, regulating the environment, federal environmental regulation has largely left the system of state regulation untouched. Why might state regulation foster technological innovation? Again, you may be thinking, hmm, state regulation means lax regulation. But not all federal regulation is strict and not all state regulation is lax. Again, the more apt significance of state regulation may be that regulatory oversight of the oil and gas industry is decentralized. Different states have different approaches uh, and some states may be more tolerant of experimental or innovative techniques than others. Again, this differs from other countries where oil and gas regulation is, tends to be centralized in a single governmental entity. Why might decentralized regulation promote innovation? Again, it may just be that regulators are risk averse as, a as an average matter. Uh, uh, the degree of risk aversion will vary somewhat along a spectrum. Some regulators are more risk averse than others. But when regulation is decentralized, a new technology like fracking can find at least one or two states that are willing to allow it to get going. This sets in motion a natural experiment. If the results look good and the risks do not seem too great, then risk averse regulators in other states are likely to go along. If the risks look bad or the risks are too great, regulators in other states will throw up roadblocks to the new technology and the experiment will wither away. In a more centralized regulatory environment, which tends to be the norm in other parts of the world, the experiment is less likely to get off the ground because the regulators on average are risk averse and being the only game in town, their risk aversion is likely to translate into hostility toward technological innovation. The last piece of the puzzle that I would suggest, and there may be other factors that I haven't thought of, is the United States uh, has a highly developed infrastructure of pipelines and a practice of treating pipelines as common carriers open to all. This allows small producers without their own pipelines or without significant economic or political clout to gain access to markets. Again, the situation in other parts of the world is very different where pipelines are either owned by the government or are not regarded as common carriers. One could say that the United States has a relatively open infrastructure in, in energy markets, at least on this dimension, and that this allows experimentation by small firms to flourish. So if I had to sum up the factors that seem to me to explain why the United States developed fracking technology before anybody else did, and everybody else is way behind us at this point, I would say in one word, decentralization. Specifically, decentralization of control over resource development, one case study obviously has not proved the general point, but the fracking revolution is at least a cautionary tale for those who assume that more federal funding of research projects is the key to innovation in energy. It may be that entrepreneurialism, local control, and private property rights are a better recipe for developing game-changing technological breakthroughs, i.e. with renewables. Okay, that's my first lecture. The second question is whether fracking presents any novel environmental problems that warrant a change in our existing system of environmental regulation. Why the emphasis on novel risks? A thought experiment might be helpful here. Um, imagine a discovery uh, in the United States of a new uh, conventional source of uh, oil and gas equivalent in magnitude uh, 
uh, to the additional reserves of oil and gas that have been produced by fracking. In other words, imagine that some new seismic technology comes along that allows us to find a whole bunch of new oil and gas conventional res reserves in backyards in various parts of the country. How, if at all, would the risks posed by fracking differ from the risks posed by the sudden discovery of new conventional reserves of oil and gas? The question is important, I think, because it tells us whether we need new laws and regulations to deal with fracking. To the extent that fracking generated production is no different than a surging con conventional production, the solution, at least as a first pass, is presumably to ratchet up the existing regulatory framework uh, for oil and gas production to meet the challenges of the new surge in production. If, however, fracking presents new risks that have no parallel under the conventional production, then we have to start thinking about developing a new regulatory framework to deal with the new risks. The Environmental Bill of Indictment against fracking is a long one and is growing rapidly. Uh, John Nolan, last night at dinner, said that New York has identified 36 risks associated with fracking. I'm not going to discuss them all. I don't even know what they all are. Uh, some of the more um, uh, prominent are as follows. Um, uh, one uh, uh, concern, of course, uh, is that uh, fracking by producing cheap gas is going to undermine the conversion to renewable sources of energy and hence will compromise our efforts to reduce uh, the risk of climate change. This is a sufficiently important question that I'm going to postpone it to the fourth issue that I discuss. Uh, for many landowners who own property in the vicinity of prospecting frac fracking op operations, uh, the most critical concern is that fracking will contaminate groundwater aquifers, jeopardizing uh, water supplies and property values. Fracking fluid, uh, these lubricants in the fracking fluid contain uh, a percentage, small percentage of chemicals, uh, often undisclosed, so we don't know exactly what they are, but some of these chemicals appear to be toxics, like arsenic, and some appear to be known carcinogens, like benzene. If these chemicals somehow find their way into the groundwater, they could pose a health risk or, at the very least, could seriously impair property values by making the water uh, unpotable. Other prominent charges against fracking include damage to local roads due to heavy truck traffic, uh, general stress on local infrastructures, cause, uh, air pollution caused by releases from poorly controlled or ventilated uh, wells or containment ponds, <coughs> unsustainable demands on local water supplies, damage to wildlife habitat required by construction of new pipelines, and even earthquakes. The question is which, if any, of these risks requires the development of a new regulatory regime. All these concerns are, are matters of uh, genuine uh, uh, consideration. Uh, many, however, are the kinds of externalities that would be generated by an upsurge in conventional oil and gas production. Here I would include increased truck traffic, stress on local infrastructures, air pollution uh, from uh, uh, the ventilation of methane gas from wells and from local surface operations, and habitat destruction from pipelines. If we had a sudden surge in conventional gas, we would have all these phenomena to deal with, and therefore there's reason to believe that those problems can be addressed by at least enhancing the scale of existing regulatory um, uh, systems. Among the risks that are unique to fracking include its voracious consumption of water. But the demand for water used in fracking options operations uh, appears to be manageable, at least in the eastern part of the United States, areas like Pennsylvania and Ohio, where surface water, uh, which is renewable, is used in fracking operations. In areas like West, West Texas, where groundwater has to be tapped, uh, existing permitting schemes uh, allocating water under a first appropriation system it can be used to allocate scarce local water supplies. Ideally, uh, producers will develop recycling techniques which will uh, reduce uh, significantly the demand on water supplies and make this uh, issue uh, somewhat less pressing. Earthquake risks fall into the category of more study needed. Uh, uh, it, pro it appears that there is some seismic activity low, low, uh, associated with fracking uh, at a very low level. There was one episode, I think it was in Ohio, that involved injection of spent fracking fluid into ge deep geologic formations that was allegedly associated with some earthquake activity. Um, so it's hard to know whether fracking presents a genuine risk on this front or not. If deep injection causes earthquakes, then plans uh, for carbon sequestration by deep injection of CO2 also need to be reexamined. So this may either be not a problem or a problem unique to fracking, not, un not unique to fracking. <coughs> 
The water contamination risks strike me as where the real concerns lie. And these are the concerns, I think, that loom largest in the public imagination. There are also a category of risks that presents a plausible claim to being novel and unprecedented. The matter is complicated by the variety of potential pathways of water contamination. The pathway that's received the most attention in the media is the prospect that fracking fluid injected into deep shale formations might migrate upward through fractures into groundwater aquifers. There's no documented evidence of this actually happening, and most experts think it's unlikely. But the ba and the basic reason is that the shale seams are typically uh, so deep, up to a mile underground and below water aquifers, that the enormous weight of the rock above the seams will compress any fractures that might otherwise allow fracking fluid to migrate upward. Still, fracking involves the uncontrolled release of toxic chemicals below the ground, out of sight, and in a fashion that's almost impossible to monitor. This makes people understandably nervous, and I don't blame them. We've had other experience recently in which experts have assured us that complicated and novel activities, like buying and selling collateralized debt obligations, <laughs> pose no risk, and we should just forget about and learn to uh, uh, accept this, and we have uh, learned to regret uh, relying on that type of expert reassurance. Other pathways of contamination might come from deep geologic formations where fracking fluid is injected after it's uh, uh, become a waste product. Again, the depth of the injection, the lack of porosity in the overlying rock, and the natural force of gravity make contamination of aquifers uh, that are much closer to the surface highly unlikely, but the uncontrolled nature of the injection of the chem waste chemicals causes legitimate apprehension. Other potential pathways of water contamination have elicited less public attention but may present greater risks. Improper sealing of drilling pipes could allow fracking fluid to escape at depths much closer to aquifers. Improper lining of containment, surface containments could lead to the leaching of fluid into the groundwater. Unprotected blowouts could have the same effect. Accidental spills from trucks are always a possibility. It's also possible that fracking activity might disturb pockets of methane gas close to the surface aquifers and could add or could agitate sediment in the bottom of existing water wells which could contaminate well water. Collectively, uh, it seems to me, the water containment risks are relatively novel and have elicited a fair degree of anxiety. Uh, regulations of the best practices variety designed to minimize the risk from leaking uh, uh, are possible in some contexts. For example, we can make sure that vertical pipes are properly sealed. Uh, with blowout protectors are installed, the surface containments have liners that are properly uh, uh, protective and so on and so forth. But at present, there's no known technology for reducing the risks for many of the potential pathways of contamination, including the scariest if the most remote risk presented by the injection of fracking fluid into deep shale seams or into geologic formations for disposal. So I would conclude that water contamination risks are novel risks and do not have any close parallel in conventional oil and gas production, the experts may be right that based on the geology, uh, the risks of contamination are close to zero, but only time and experience will tell for sure. Meanwhile, everyone who draws water from an aquifer above or in the vicinity of a fracking a project is a guinea pig, and we need to put in place some regulatory system to address the risks of water contamination associated with the uncontrolled release or injection of fracking fluid. The third question is, um, given that fracking fluid, at least in my opinion, does present some novel risks associated with water contamination, what sort of regulatory system should we put in place to address those risks? Uh, David Schizer at Columbia, my dean and colleague, and I are currently writing a paper about this. Uh, let me uh, offer just some of the highlights of our argument. Uh, the first issue uh, to consider is whether we should have a system of ex-ante or ex-post regulation. Ex-ante regulation tries to head off the harm before it happens. Ex-post regulation puts a price on the, on the harm after it has occurred. In many contexts, ex-ante regulation is better, particularly if we have significant information about harms and how to pre prevent them. But we don't have, at present, any good information about the magnitude and incidence of harms associated with water contamination caused by fracking. With respect to the central source of public anxiety, the risks of migration of contaminants from shale rock formations to nearby aquifers 
we have a classic he said, she said situation. The industry says, don't worry about it, the risk is non-existent. The environmentalists say the harm is potentially catastrophic. And until we've had more experience with, environment, with horizontal fracking, we just don't know for sure who's right. Nor do we have good options for controlling the incidence of contamination, certainly not from all potential pathways of contamination. We know how producers can minimize the risks of contam contamination from surface activities like uh, leaky containment tanks or spills from trucks. We were basically in the dark about how to minimize the risks from fracking activity itself. Again, over time, consensus views will probably emerge about best practices to minimize these risks, but for the moment, producers are in a learning by doing mode. Without better information, it's impossible to design a sensible system of ex-ante regulation. Environmentalists might say, when in doubt, apply the precautionary principle. But the only type of ex-ante regulation that we could possibly adopt at this point, given the dearth of information we have about expected harms and control measures, would be to ban fracking uh, until further information is gathered about potential adverse effects. How that would happen, I'm not sure. Maybe we'd have pilot projects out in Nevada uh, next to uh, the abandoned Yucca Mountain uh, storage facility for nuclear waste. Um, sometimes moratoriums make sense, I will grant you, uh, until we know more about the likely benefits and costs uh, or risks of an activity. For example, I would probably agree that it makes sense to put a moratorium on human cloning before we know more about the implications of something like that. But with respect to fracking, a, cup, a complete moratorium doesn't really seem very sensible. For one thing, hydraulic fracturing has been used with conventional vertical wells for 60 years without any notable adverse effects. For another thing, scientific, the scientific explanation for why upward migration of fracking fluids will not occur seems at least plausible and has been endorsed in principle by expert panels at both the EPA and the Energy Department. To be sure, adding horizontal fracking, horizontal drilling to fracturing increases the risks of subsurface contamination, but it doesn't change the risk very much with respect to surface contamination, except insofar as the total amount of fracking activity goes up. In any event, it's too late to impose a complete moratorium on fracking. The horse has already left the proverbial barn. Under the circumstances, I think the only feasible way to regulate the novel water contamination risks presented by fracking is ex post. Practically speaking, that means some kind of liability rule for water contamination that can be causally linked to fracking activity after it occurs. Dean Schizer and I have an elaborate discussion of what an optimal liability regime might look like. It would feature strict liability, mandatory baseline testing of water quality to help resolve causation questions, attorney fee shifting for successful claimants, and posting of bonds or evidence of insurance to confront, contend with insolvency risks. Ideally, it would be established by legislation, most likely we think at the state rather than the federal level, and such legislation we suggest should provide for an expeditious and inexpensive administrative system for processing claims. Unfortunately, the ideal is almost certainly unattainable. The sad truth about environmental harms recognized some years ago by Jim Creer in a little essay called The End of the World News, is that legislatures will not act until there is incontrovertible evidence of a link between some activity and a real, present, tangible harm. Abstract demonstration of a risk will not motivate legislatures to start adopting regulatory systems. I'm reasonably confident that this sad proposition is true of fracking. Until there's an irrefutable demonstration that subsurface fracking activity has led to water contam contamination on a significant scale, we're not going to see legislation prescribing some ideal liability regime. Happily enough, not all is lost because we have a non-ideal liability regime that can be dusted off and applied to any water contamination episodes that may occur, the good old common law of torts. The common law of torts does not have all the features that Schizer and I recommend, like fee shifting, posting of bonds, and administrative adjudication. But it's not beyond the realm of imagination to think that the common law, when applied to alleged water contamination due to fracking, could be applied in such a way as to approach the kind of liability regime we would consider desirable. Let me just address two issues very briefly. With respect to the standard of care, we recommend strict liability in part to create incentives for producers to adjust activity levels and to keep searching for innovative ways to minimize harm. 
More importantly, we think, given the novelty of horizontal hydrofracking technology, there's simply not enough information to apply a standard of negligence, which asks whether reasonable precautions were available to prevent the harm. A common law court confronted with a water contamination case might reach the same conclusion, applying the venerable precedent of Rylands versus Fletcher, which of course you all remember from your first year law student course in torts those of you who went to law school. <laughs> Contamination from fracking, like Rylands, involves the invasion of one landowner's property by a waterborne substance propelled from another landowner's property. In both cases, the invasion occurs below the surface of the land. In both cases, the injured landowner is passive and in no sense responsible or contributory to the harm. In both cases, the source of the escape of liquids can be said to be a non-natural use of the land. So a common law court could easily reason, reason from Rylands, which has been accepted by some 30 out of the 50 states as a legitimate precedent, to the proposition that strict liability should govern fracking contamination. A somewhat similar story can be told about the proof of causation. Ordinarily, the plaintiff has the burden of proving causation. This could prove to be an almost insuperable barrier in a water contamination without evidence of what the quality of the water was before the fracking activity took place. Thus, our ideal liability regime would require baseline testing of water quality, plus mandatory disclosure of fracking chemicals, and perhaps down the road even the mandatory use of harmless tracer chemicals in fracking, fracking fluid, all of which would dramatically lower the barriers to establishing causation. The common law court obviously could not mandate all these things, certainly not before any lawsuit was filed. But a clever court might be able to adopt some presumptions about causation, which would have the effect of creating salutary incentives for baseline testing, which I think is the most important requirement. Thus, for example, a court could create a presumption of causation uh, if the producer had not obtained samples of water from the vicinity before fracking begins. This would create an incentive for producers to obtain and secure samples as part of the lease negotiation process. And if any landowner refused to cooperate in the taking of water samples, the court could create a counter presumption of no causation should that landowner later decide to sue for water contamination. So with a little creativity, a common law court might make some progress on the causation front, creating incentives for uh, widespread baseline testing of water quality before fracking starts. The common law has the further virtue that any issue that's likely to come up in a liability regime has come up in some form in the common law. Thus, questions about defenses based on plaintiff misconduct, joint and several liability, the measure of damages, the enforcement of judgments, and so on, will have some off-the-shelf answer under the common law. Any legislated liability rule would undoubtedly be incomplete and would have to draw on the common law by analogy in any event. Finally, it's also worth noting that state legislation often, state legislatures oftenly, often intervene on discrete issues that arise in the course of common law adjudication in order to facilitate better results. If I could single out a single issue that I would have the legislature weigh in on, it would be to require baseline sampling of local water supplies before fracking begins. Of course, given the clear rule that no environmental legislation is forthcoming until harmful effects are established, even this may be too much to hope for. But it would be worth trying to get such legislation and this might be something that would be in the interest of both producers and local opponents of fracking to agree upon as a step toward alleviating uncertainty about the effects of fracking. Fourth question, what should a concerned citizen worried about climate change think about fracking? Global warming is a global phenomenon. This means that what happens in one part of the world may not do much to stop global warming if it's offset by an equal and opposite change in another part of the world. Let me offer a sad example. The Europeans, who care a lot about climate change, have aggressively pushed alternative energy sources like solar and wind power. To pay for this, they have required ratepayers to subsidize solar and wind producers through higher rates on electricity. Higher rates on electricity have accelerated the movement of industry from Europe to Asia, where operating costs are lower. But in Asia, electricity is predominantly produced by power plants that burn coal. So subsidizing alternative energy sources in Europe may lead to higher rather than lower greenhouse gas emissions on a global basis as industry shifts from Europe to Asia. How does all this relate to fracking and the fracking revolution in the United States? 
Let's start with some simple evidence about the trend in greenhouse gas emissions in the last five years on three continents, Asia, Europe, and North America. In Asia, greenhouse gas emissions are up quite a bit as China and other Asian countries rapidly industrialize and have built thousands of coal-burning power plants that generate the electricity needed to power this industrialization process. In Europe, interestingly, greenhouse gas emissions are at best stable or a bit worse than they were five years ago. Why is that? Natural gas is expensive in Europe, it's, uh, and it's subject to uncertainty because the supplies are controlled by Russia. Nuclear is on the outs after Chernobyl and Fukushima. Renewables are expensive and as yet are a relatively small part of the picture. So for a variety of reasons, Europeans are burning more coal to generate electricity. The good news is the United States, the country without a comprehensive climate change policy. Greenhouse emissions in the United States have fallen in the last five years. Why is that? Some progress uh, is due to the economic slump and the improvements in the fuel efficiency of cars. But by far the most important contributor is the big shift in power generation that's taken place from coal to natural gas, spurred by the cheap gas generated by the fracking revolution. Power plants that run on natural gas emit about 50% of the greenhouse gases emitted by plants generated by coal. So the displacement of coal plants by cheap natural gas-fired plants in the U.S. has given us the winning report card in terms of recent progress in controlling greenhouse gas emissions. What, if anything, can we conclude from this? Not very much, unfortunately. If the U.S. gets a B or a B plus for reducing greenhouse gases because of the shift from coal to gas, this will not matter in the larger picture if the U.S. continues to outsource industrial production to China, which generates power using coal. In order for natural gas to make a truly significant contribution to greenhouse gas emissions on a global basis, which is the only relevant basis, it would be necessary to replace the use of coal with natural gas in Europe, Asia, and the rest of the developing world, as well as in the United States. Now, this might happen. One small step in the right direction would be for the United States to develop a robust in export industry in liquefied natural gas. This would help make a partial transition to gas possible in countries like Japan. Of course, the more we export gas, the higher the price of gas in the United States, which could slow down the transition toward gas here. Longer term, other countries in Europe and Asia are likely to develop fracking technology themselves and expand their own gas reserves. A small step in this direction would be for the United States to encourage the export of fracking technology to countries in other continents. Twenty years from now, we may be seeing China switching from coal to gas based on the development of new gas reserves using fracking China technology on newly discovered shale deposits in China. Another variable in all this is oil. If fracking technology in the U.S. and elsewhere expands the production of oil, this will tend to hold the price in oil of, of oil in check on a world basis. Lower prices for oil on a relatively relative basis will encourage more cars and more driving and will add to the total volume of greenhouse gases worldwide. Electric cars may provide a partial answer to this, but again, if the new electric cars sold in China are charged using electricity from new coal-burning plants, Little will have been gained, so it all comes back to coal plants in China. A third variable to add to the mix is the impact of the fracking revolution on renewables. Uh, cheap gas, as I said at the outset of these remarks, is poison for renewables. If we assume that technology stands still from now to the end of this century, renewables will never be able to compete with cheap gas without massive government subsidies. And the lesson of history in the U.S. at least is that subsidies for alternative fuels are not politically sustainable over the long period of time. Thus, in a static technological world, the best bet for heading off climate change would probably be to press ahead on all fronts to promote the use of fracking generating cheap gas. But of course, technology does not stand still. Over time, there's reason to believe we will achieve a technological breakthrough in renewables analogous to the breakthrough achieved with fracking which brings me back to my first question, how do we stimulate innovation in the production of energy? One answer, as I suggested, is to promote innovation through um, creating the conditions in which entrepreneurial ventures can thrive. Another constructive form of government intervention would be to have a carbon tax, which would be designed to equalize the social costs, including climate change costs, of carbon fuels versus renewables, 
and thereby put renewables on a level playing field with carbon fuels. We in our country is most likely to adopt a carbon tax. Never uh, is maybe the short and cynical answer. But if there is a time in which countries might be induced to adopt a carbon tax, it seems to me that the most auspicious time would be when the price of carbon fuels is going down, not up. And that is, and how, what is likely to bring about carb, the price of carbon fuels going down in the foreseeable future? Everyone altogether fracking. So I would conclude that a conscientious citizen concerned about global warming should support the fracking revolution. Cheap gas will upend nuclear and renewables at least temporarily, but more importantly, it will displace coal. If this can be done on a global basis, significant progress will have been made against global warming. Cheap gas and potentially cheaper oil will also make it more likely that legislatures will at some day in the future agree to adopt a carbon tax which could help stimulate innovation in renewables over the long term. Cheap gas is thus probably the best strategy on the horizon for reducing greenhouse gases until we see a technological breakthrough in renewables. And the only way to get cheap gas that's presently on the horizon is to support fracking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. We have a few minutes uh, left in this session. Uh, and Professor Merrill has agreed that he would take some questions uh, during that time. Uh, because we are being webcast, um, let me uh, encourage you to uh, come to one of the, the mics down here uh, in, the, in the aisles uh, to, uh, for your questions. Um, but uh, let's open the floor for uh, folks who might have some. Thank you for a very thoughtful presentation. Is this yeah. working properly? Um, you referred to Rylands versus Fletcher and its adoption in a number of jurisdictions, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe the current trend uh, in analyzing oil and gas activities and strict liability is the analysis for abnormally dangerous activities right. under sections 519 and 520, the restatement second mm -hmm. of torts. Yeah. And 520 lists five factors to be considered in evaluating whether or not the activity is, in fact, abnormally dangerous in the particular context. Right. Have you con looked at that analysis and thought about how a, a court would apply that analysis in the context you're addressing? Right. Yeah. I, um, well, first of all, the third restatement has streamlined things relative to the second restatement, thank goodness. So instead of five factors, we now only have uh, two and a half. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so let me, in the interest of streamlining my answer, talk about the third rather than the second restatement. The, the third restatement suggests that if it's a significant harm uh, or risk which cannot be reduced by ordinary uh, exercise of due care <coughs> and is relatively uncommon, uh, then uh, uh, it's an abnormally dangerous activity uh, as to which strict liability might apply. Um, of those factors, I think the one that perhaps is the most doubtful as applied to fracking is the significant harm or significant risk point. Uh, uh, again, we don't have a lot of evidence now of water contamination, so it's hard to point to uh, significant examples of harm being generated uh, to water supplies by fracking. So the producers who are arguing for negligence rather than strict liability may be able to argue successfully that this is not a significant risk. Uh, and therefore inappropriate to be called abnormally dangerous. Uh, on the other two factors, though, I think fracking does arguably fit. Uh, first of all, as I tried to suggest, there really is presently no established conventional technology that would be available to reduce the risks uh, uh, of water contamination from fracking. Uh, so it, it fits the idea that if there's a risk that's significant and can't be reduced uh, using uh, reasonable care, uh, strict liability is appropriate. And secondly, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to know what uncommon means. Uh, uh, it could mean uh, rare and flukish, in which case maybe fracking is not uncommon because it's spreading like wildfire everywhere. On the other hand, hand you could say that historically speaking, it's uncommon. It's not something that we witnessed very much uh, five or ten years ago. And so in the sense of being unfamiliar to our experience and, and, and something as to which we don't have uh, the kind of familiarity to know how to respond to reduce the risk is uncommon in that sense. So I, I prefer Rylands because I think the analogy 
uh, is cleaner and more provocative and might be more persuasive to a court. But I think you could argue, at least potentially, that it fits into uh, the restatement's provisions on abnormally dangerous uh, activity. Uh, but I admit that it's a bit of a harder argument. Thank you, Elizabeth Burleson, Pace University. Um, I, I, could you expand on the um, export of the fracking technology with regard to, say, full combustion, and not necessarily in the water context, but in the flaring context or the venting context? Because uh, the carbon tax is a mismatch with regard to natural gas, where methane is really the key issue. And across the range of greenhouse gases, Hydraulic fracturing really presents a, a much larger challenge in the methane context right. than in the carbon context. But your mention of um, best practices with regard to technology that's being innovated in this country, I think there's real potential there with trying to optimize, um, you know, venting, flaring, and full combustion. Right. Yeah. I'm, I, I uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I th I, from what little I know about this, yes, the, the venting of methane gas is worse from a climate perspective than is flaring of uh, excess uh, gas or, or wellhead gas uh, that can't be captured for commercial purposes. And so from a carbon tax perspective, you would somehow want to uh, adjust the tax so that much higher taxes were imposed on people that uh, just simply released a methane gas from a well as opposed to those that flared the gas. Uh, uh, I, I don't have any more profound insights uh, about that than just that, that, you know, it, a carbon tax would prevent thousands of, and thousands of technical difficult issues about how to set the tax and how to measure the greenhouse gas potential of different uh, e emissions, and, and this would certainly be one of them. But uh, ideally, you would want... Um, Ideally, you'd want to have a system where producers could capture almost all the gas, store it, and then, you know, use it commercially. Uh, if they can't do that, then I think you're right that flaring is preferable to uh, uncontrolled releases of methane gas, and you would want to create a system of incentives to push people in that direction. Yeah, sir. Uh, my question is uh, uh, regulatory systems, and have you had a chance to look at reliability organizations, things that airlines and yeah. nuclear power. Have you looked at that and what are your thoughts? Right, yeah, so um, there was uh, a group called the uh, 90 Day Study Subcommittee that was appointed by the Secretary of Energy pursuant to uh, an order from President Obama transmitted from Secretary of Energy Chu uh, that looked at the fracking environmental issues and one of their strongest recommendations was to try to beef up uh, the sort of voluntaristic uh, trade association uh, aspects among fracking producers to try to have them collectively discuss be best practices and to dis disseminate information about best practices. And I have nothing against that. I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, and again, in a situation where we don't really have a lot of information about best practices, we're really in the very beginning stages of this uh, revolution. That strikes me as a much better way of getting the discussion going about best practices rather than having some massive regulatory proceeding where some regulatory agency is trying to figure out what they are at this snapshot in time and then impose them as law and then have to constantly revise them as best practices evolve. So uh, I, I think as a starting point toward, and, and, and again, it's very complicated because I think that with respect to some pathways of contamination like trucks turning over and spilling, we do have some best practices information. So. There are areas of, with respect to contamination where we do have this information. We ought to sort of impose that by regulation. Uh, other areas we have no clue. We ought to have, I think, you know, sort of voluntaristic information exchanges through some type of trade association that's created to discuss these things. Maybe that would evolve into some kind of regulatory <laughs> requirement eventually uh, uh, once, the, uh, once the ideas stabilize and, and become uh, traditional or, cons or customary practices uh, in the strong sense of the word. In the meantime, I can't think of any way of handling risks except to have this ex post liability regime as a kind of fallback. Yeah. Hello, my name is Ali, and I'm a student here at the law school, and I just want to thank you for mm -hmm. coming. Um, my question is related to the, oh, uh, the unique nature of uh, horizontal fracturing. Because uh, usually with vertical pipes, it's straight down, and it's pretty straightforward from a property standpoint because of the subsidiary right. But because of the horizontal nature,
And the length of these shales are not only uh, hundreds of feet, but also thousands of feet and can and expand over multiple state lines. And the majority regulation right now for oil and gas is in the states, and some states, like Texas and even Ohio, have really strong regulatory schemes because uh, they have a history of it. But new states, North Dakota, Michigan even, uh, New Mexico, where there is less regulatory scheme, do you see that oil companies and, and these new technologies are going to game the system of the, of the state regulatory schemes and push it towards creating more of a federal uh, regulation regime in the future to uh, regulate this industry? Mm. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm sure you're right that there are some shale deposits that cross state lines, but I'm not sure that that's like a major aspect of the, of the picture. I think most shale deposits are probably located in one state rather than another. Uh, if you had a shale deposit that was in multiple states, then maybe some kind of interstate compact or something would be the appropriate way of trying to handle uh, uh, that particular risk. Uh, I completely agree with your characterization that there's sort of different degrees of, of uh, you know, refinement in regulatory schemes from one state to the next. The states that have had a lot of energy production are likely to have much more refined schemes. And the states, I mean, New York would be a classic example, I guess, of a state that's got a lot of shale, I guess, but, you know, uh, its energy uh, regulatory system has been dormant for a long time, and so they're kind of in a position of having to come up with something from scratch. Now, New York is an example of a state that when they're supposed to come up with something in, from scratch, is the, the impulse is to come up with an extremely large, cumbersome, oppressive regulatory system. Um, and other states, you know, like North Dakota maybe, uh, you know, don't have the uh, sort of regulatory infrastructure to be that sophisticated. So I, I grant you all that. I do think that uh, what you'll see if you have state regulation uh, through oil and gas commissions, plus maybe common law backstop, uh, is you'll see a lot of looking over the shoulder and emulating uh, what other states are doing, a lot of borrowing of best ideas from one state to the next. Um, you know, if, uh, if it looks like a certain type of regulation is very helpful in enhancing production and reducing spillovers, I would guess that other states would, would catch on to that and emulate it. Um, uh, I don't really see a strong case for federal regulation uh, at this point. The harm, uh, the water contamination harm appears to be relatively localized. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's so localized that probably even local regulation might be ideal in terms of the scope of the externality. I don't think local governments have nearly the expertise to, to handle the regulatory aspects, so probably state oil and gas commissions are, are the best sort of regulatory structure to build out from uh, based on what we have now. But I, I think you'll have a, a learning process among the states as they sort of look over their shoulders, emulate each other, see what works and what, what doesn't work. And that's probably a good thing since right now we don't have any good ideas about, with respect to the core risks, exactly what, what's best and what's not. Break time. Okay. Um, I think that uh, if, if there are no f further questions, um, let's take a break. We are scheduled to reconvene at 1030. Um, and let's thank Professor Merrill for really setting this up. <laughs>